Uh, welcome and thank you all for joining today's panel discussion. My name is Alyssa Heder and I'm the Deputy Director of the IIP. We at the IIP provide a collaborative national platform that brings together prosecutors, policy experts, and the communities they serve to promote data-driven strategies, cutting edge scholarship, and innovative thinking. This is the first of a three-part webinar series about wrongful convictions. I am so thrilled to be hosting this series, which will provide unique perspectives in the field of exonerations. Over the next few weeks, you're going to hear from attorneys who do this crucial work, both as prosecutors and defense attorneys. You're also going to hear from impacted people whose stories are all, uh, often overlooked, the original crime victims and their relatives. Uh, but first today for our launch event, we are going to examine the exoneration of Mark Denny, who was wrongfully convicted of a rape and robbery in 1989. Mr. Denny served almost 30 years for a crime he did not commit in Brooklyn, New York. We are so honored to have him with us as part of this discussion today. I'd like to introduce all of our guests in detail, but before I do that, I'm going to read the IIP's land acknowledgement statement. We want to acknowledge that the IIP and John Jay College are based in New York City, which is the Lenape homeland. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude and acknowledge the genocide and continuous displacement of indigenous people. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built Manhattan during the colonial era and beyond. We acknowledge the harm inflicted upon the indigenous communities and people of color across the country, which continues to inspire our ongoing work. Uh, it's now my privilege to introduce our moderator and panelists for today's discussion. For time's sake, I'm gonna keep the bios relatively short uh, but we're going to put a link to their biographies in the chat and I encourage you to check them out and learn more about them and the incredible work that they're doing. So first is our moderator, Debo Adegbele, who is a partner at Wilmer Hale and has a long distinguished career. He has significant experience in both civil and appellate litigation, including in connection with criminal appeals. Debo chairs Wilmer Hale's anti-discrimination practice. Prior to Wilmer Hale, Debo's experience includes senior roles for the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and in the leadership of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Last year, Debo led a team of Wilmer Hale lawyers and co-authored a report called 426 Years, an examination of 25 wrongful convictions in Brooklyn, New York, together with the Innocence Project and the Brooklyn DA's office. Uh, Mark Denny. Mark Denny immigrated to the New York City area from Guyana when he was a young child. Although he was wrongfully convicted and tragically served three decades in prison for a crime he did not commit, during his incarceration, Mr. Denny received his certificate to be a barber. Upon his release in 2017, he continued his education and got his license so, he, uh, so that he can now open his own barber shop, a goal of his that he intends on making a reality when the pandemic subsides. Mr. Denny is an avid runner and completed the New York City Half Marathon in 2019. He also has a book coming out soon called The Awakening Process. Nina Morrison, as Senior Litigation Counsel at the Innocence Project, Nina Morrison litigates claims for access to post-conviction DNA evidence under both federal civil rights laws and state DNA testing statutes. To date, Ms. Morrison has served as lead or co-counsel for more than 20 innocent prisoners who were freed from prison or death row based on DNA or other newly discovered evidence. Uh, I personally have to give a big shout out to Ms. Morrison who has been incredibly helpful to us in developing our program, uh, not just for this panel today, but for the webinar series that we have on wrongful convictions. Um, and she has really helped ensure that we put together the most informative panels for everybody. Uh, next is Dr. Jennifer Dysart, a tenured associate professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She holds a PhD in uh, social psychology from Queens University and has been conducting research on eyewitness identification for over 20 years. Her research primarily examines how police identification procedures can influence the mistaken identification of innocent people and how the implementation of safeguards may reduce these errors. Last but certainly not least is Lisa Perlman, who became, excuse me, began her career as a prosecutor at the Brooklyn DA's office in 1996. Lisa spent several years in the conviction review unit, investigating cases to determine if there had been a wrongful conviction. 
Uh, four of Lisa's investigations resulted in exonerations, including Mr. Denner, uh, Mr. Denny, who we have here today, uh, along with three men convicted of an arson they did not commit, two of whom spent over 30 years in prison and one of whom died after serving nine years. She is currently chief of the sealing unit in the Brooklyn DA's office, which under a New York state law enacted in 2017, answers motions by individuals seeking to seal records of nonviolent convictions that create obstacles to obtaining employment, housing, and other opportunities. Uh, additionally, Lisa handles post-conviction motions for resentencing made by defendants under the New York State Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, which was enacted in 2019. Uh, Ms. Perlman served on an advisory committee for Healing Justice, a national nonprofit organization that provides support to both original crime victims and exonerees in wrongful conviction cases and exonerations. So thank you for, for, to all of you for joining today's panel. Um, I wanna encourage the audience to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send questions throughout today's panel. And if time permits, we hope that Debo can help uh, facilitate responses to, to questions that people in the audience have at the very end. Uh, and with that, I am finally gonna turn it over to Debo. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this important discussion. Thank you, Mr. Denny. For, for joining us and sharing your story. And thanks to the, the team that worked on this important case today and to John Jay for hosting this important conversation. Um, so I wanted to start with a little context and share that according to the National Registry of Exonerations, there have been 2,700 exonerations in the United States since 1989. Each of these cases as one might imagine, exacts a profound human toll. With the wrongly convicted people in these cases having served over 24,600 years in prison, it's an astonishing number that boggles the mind and that we all must take measure of. The injustice and human suffering is incomprehensible. It's, it's before recorded time, if we think about it. And today we examine one of the major causes of these wrongful convictions, poor identifications. Turning to the facts of this case to set the table, on December 20th, 1987, two men wearing ski masks approached employees of a Burger King in Brooklyn as they were closing the restaurant and forced them to reopen the restaurant. Once inside, the male employee was kept in a stock room while the female employee sadly was raped by the two men. At some point, the two men were joined by at least one other male. Mr. Denny was arrested as one of the perpetrators and ultimately convicted at trial. Decades later, because of the serious identification issues that we'll explore today. In this case, and many other reasons that we'll hear more about as well, the Kings County DA's office agreed that the sentence should be vacated. Today, you will get a unique look into Mr. Denny's experience and the people who are on our panel who helped demonstrate his innocence. First, we will have the lawyers explain the trajectory of the case and we'll hear directly from Mr. Denny, the man at the center of this tragedy. Nina, I'd like to start with you as we, as we dig in here. Um, I imagine that the Innocence Project, the national expert on these issues, receives what must be a, a staggering number of requests to dig into cases and to explore the facts, reinvestigate them, and try and bring forward evidence um, of exonerations. I'm wondering if you could help us understand how you think about that process, how you sort through them, and more particularly, what jumped out to you about this case? What made Innocence, the Innocence Project recognize that this was one where you needed to lend your considerable efforts and expertise? 
Um, thanks, Devo, and thanks to Alyssa and IIP for this panel. I'm really thrilled to be here um, in part because I've been thinking about trying to find a way for Lisa Perlman in particular from the DA's office to talk about her experience working on this case to an audience of other prosecutors and advocates in the community um, because she did such an extraordinary, really amazing job. Um, you know, I've had a lot of cases where I have had to fight very hard against opposition from people in law enforcement to get access to DNA evidence, um, basic information that I needed to represent my clients or even get people out once we had DNA or other evidence proving their innocence. But you know, in more than I would say a third of my exoneration cases so far, you know, my clients would not be home today if it wasn't for a conscientious prosecutor on the other side who went the extra mile to either give us access to evidence, hear me out, uh, or in some cases do a full reinvestigation. And I think, you know, every case is unique and is a tragedy in its own way, but this case is really a model, I think, for how prosecutors offices, defense lawyers and experts can work together to get to the bottom of a wrongful conviction. Um, so in answer to your question, um, you were right. We get uh, thousands of requests for legal assistance from around the country. We accept typically only about 2% of the cases of people who write to us. We have a very talented staff, a whole department called the Intake and Evaluation Department that screens and evaluates the cases. Um, for many years, including when we took on Mark's case, we were only taking cases where DNA evidence had the potential to clear our clients, some DNA that was either never tested or could be retested with modern techniques. Um, if along the way, after we took a case, as in Marks, we discovered other avenues through which they could be exonerated, we would take the facts where they led us. But to get in the door, you needed that um, potential for DNA to exonerate you. Um, Mark's case was a little tricky in that regard because it was a gang rape with an uncertain number of assailants. but Originally, it was a pretty straightforward theory that if there had been four men and Mark was not one of them and we could get DNA from four different men and the victim in this case was, uh, had never had sexual intercourse with anybody before her assault, um, scientifically we could prove his innocence. Um, but there were other things that jumped out as well that really pushed his case into the yes column for us. Um, one, which you're gonna hear a lot about from the others, so I won't talk about it too much was uh, that it was really a one witness ID case. There were two victims in the case, but only one of them, uh, the woman who was subjected to the most trauma and had the least opportunity to view because her face was covered for most of the assault was the only one who had picked out Mark. Um, and as you'll hear from the others, there were some real red flags, both in terms of how her story, and I don't mean story as if she made it up, but her account and her recollection of, of what she saw and what she remembered changed over time in response to what seemed to us to be conscious or unconscious influence from police in particular. Um, and um, some concern on the record that there were only three perpetrators involved and not four, and that Mark who was arrested riding in the car of a cousin of his who was involved was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and the other thing that, that really stuck out for us initially and, and only increased as we worked on the case was the sense that there had been um, a rush to judgment, that it was a horrible crime, but the fact that Mark was riding in a car with someone, an older cousin who had a history of other offenses uh, and was a young black man in Brooklyn in the late 1980s, uh, led police to just presume that he was involved. And as you'll hear, the rape victim was initially shown his photograph and did not pick him out. And then two days later, he was put into a lineup where he was the only repeat uh, subject. So she saw his face twice in the course of three days. Um, I always thought to myself, you know, if, if a white man or white child in Mark's position, 16 years old, no criminal record, um, no history of violence towards anyone, had been put in a lineup, a photo array, and not had his picture selected, would the police have had him go through a second procedure two days later? And, and it's just hard to imagine that would have been the case. So I think consciously or unconsciously that that bias and that assumption that he must have had something to do with it played a role in how this happened. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nina. Lisa, I, I wanted to move to you next. And so we could get a little bit of a context about how your unit in the Kings County DA's office functions and to hear a little bit about your role in the reinvestigation of this case. As Nina said, um, evidence is, is sometimes identified, but in order to find justice in these situations, you need a state authority, a, a prosecutor's office that is willing to 
do the necessary and be open to revisiting the case. I, I think your office has been a leader in these areas and we'd love to hear about that. Thank you. And um, to echo Nina, um, I wanna thank the um, IIP and John Jay for hosting this event because as, as Nina mentioned, um, Mark Denny's case has just so much in it. It's, it's really the case that's the example of how a conviction review unit um, can, how we can show all the different areas that a, a conviction review unit can reach and how it's really different in its function from an appeals bureau or an appeals unit, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, but here, you know, we, we um, are fortunate enough as, as you alluded to, to have uh, our district attorney, Eric Gonzalez, who, um, has given you know us so much uh, leeway and margin uh, to go forward, and you know even if it's a little unconventional, we have uh, the backing, the full backing of you know the highest levels of our office, and that you know came from Ken Thompson before him as well. Um, but as I mentioned, you know we're different from an appeals bureau in that we don't get stopped by a, a statutory procedural bar or preservation rules. And, and this is exactly um, the case on point for that, because as Nina mentioned, you know, there was a real issue with the identification procedure here in that Mark was shown to the victim in a photo array and was not picked out, but two days later was put into uh, a lineup and then identified and again you know he was the only person common to both and just to sort of spell it out it was you know well was the victim recognizing him from the crime you know 10 weeks before or was she recognizing him as a photo that she'd seen and um so that was actually brought up on appeal among other issues and the appeals court found to just to quote them that it wasn't fatal to the propriety of the procedure and in a conviction review unit, we can say, hey, I think we need to unpack that a little bit more, not only because maybe it doesn't necessarily sound right, but you know, we're, we're not locked into that. And we also can know more now and, and let's seek the advice of an expert uh, to, to investigate that and learn more about what that could really mean in the context of the circumstances of this case, a brutal, brutal rape um, happening in you know to a victim who was lying down who's who's who was under enormous trauma and not only the trauma but literally had her view obscured at at many times throughout this brutal attack and i'll let dr dysart talk more about that um but so when you ask about what our investigation um, entailed, and again, I just wanna make clear and I'll make clear by going through what we did investigate that it wasn't just that there was this issue with the identification procedure and that far from best practices were used, but it, we also uncovered um, a lot of other issues. Um, we spoke to a friend of the, uh, victim who she had outcried to. And by outcry, I mean that she had spoken to in the days following and given an account. And, you know, we traveled across the country to speak with this um, friend who was able to shed light because she knew uh, the co-defendants and she knew the victims. And what we learned from speaking to her was that the male victim wore his hair in a style that had been used to describe one of the defendants, and that was uh, Jerry curls, which were you know loose curls or, or popular back in the late '80s. And we knew from from people we'd spoken to, from arrest photos, that none of the defendants had that hairstyle. And that was a big piece of information because we started when we were thinking about how the identification might have been influenced. We started to realize that, uh, and it's important to mention that as part of this attack the perpetrators forced the male victim on top of the female victim in an attempt to, to shame them and to 
you know, whatever their reasons were, but that was another person that was in that position. And there may have been a conflation of characteristics that led to um, different uh, details being conflated to and assigned to different actors. So that was very important that we learned that. We of course spoke to the original case detective um, and of course spoke to Mark Denny. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, I'm saying we, I was with uh, very seasoned detectives, uh, Detective Patrick Lanigan and Detective Robert Zuffy of our office that were integral to this investigation as well. Um, I'll talk more about this later, but we also met with the original crime victim to speak to her. We, we sort of reinvestigated the whole thing with every piece that we knew. Um, we looked at the co-defendants and that's, I guess, where I would say that this was a bit unconventional. Uh, originally, Mark's cousin brought this case, but there were serious credibility issues with that co-defendant, his, the co-defendant being Mark's cousin. Um, and there were two other co-defendants. We were able to find and speak to another co-defendant who, because of technical and calendaring reasons, his case had been severed from, from Mark and his cousin. The fourth co-defendant had pled guilty. So this co-defendant, because his case had been severed, by the time Mark and his cousin's case had been tried and it was time to try this third co-defendant, we had to dismiss the case because though there was physical evidence in the form of a fingerprint at the scene, we no longer had, one of the, um, the male victim had passed away at that point and the female victim was no longer available and we didn't have a, a case to make out besides the, the mere presence at the scene. So, um, <clears throat> This was a co-defendant that we spoke with that, you know, for all intents and purposes, he got away with this and the statute of limitations had run. But when we knocked on his door, <clears throat> I would have thought the only thing that he really could have and should have done was just slam the door on our faces because let sleeping dogs lie. But he spoke to us at great length and really broke down and did not know who was making a claim of innocence, but was able to tell us that it was Mark Denny that was not at that scene. And in the context of what his, even though he didn't have technical exposure because the statute of limitations had run, the fact that he was still willing to tell us this, he admitted his participation in the rape and it was, it was another piece. Um, and just to sort of wrap up what our, um, investigation was we were able to see that there was no mention of Mark Denny in the parole transcripts that uh, the fourth co-defendant had um, been interviewed and he never mentioned Mark Denny's name and was very specific about the other participants. And finally, of course, we have Dr. Dysart here who did a most comprehensive report and was most uh, informative about the role of how memories are formed and how that plays into all that we had uncovered as well as the specifics of the identification procedure. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Lisa. Very, very, very important uh, to, to have that frame from, from your perspective. Um, Mark, I'd like to turn to you now and uh, note that as I understand it, you, you were fighting for your innocence for almost three decades most of that time without a lawyer, without counsel. And at the point that the Innocence Project decided to join the effort, what, what was your perspective about what we have been talking about now in terms of a conviction re review process? And, and how did you think about the idea that in effect it required your legal team to engage in some type of exchange and a bit of a collaborative effort with the very same DA's office that had prosecuted you. How, how, how did that, how did you process all of that? Uh, well, for starters, you know, I want to thank uh, John Jay and Innocent Project for having me and for continuing to, you know, give attention to my case because it's something that needs attention because 
you know, as the whole purpose of putting the panel together is to try to figure out ways to prevent these things from happening. And as your uh, opening showed, you said it was over 27,000, hundred people that was released. You know, that's outstanding. And you know, in my mind, that's not even counting the people that I met while I was incarcerated that cried out to me, some of whom passed away, some of whom I don't know what's going on. But, you know, while I was in prison, apart from me being, you know, almost completely withdrawn into myself because, you know, rape has an ugly stigma and no one likes you. Even the worstest person in prison looks down on the person that's in prison for rape. And because Okay, we're, we're uh, cautiously optimistic that the, uh, there we go. Mark, you're back. We, you, you froze for a moment. You were, you were just explaining in, in prison that even, even uh, people that have co committed very severe crimes look down on rapists. The lowest of the lowest think, you know, bad about rape, period. So, you know, in prison, I became very sensitive to how disgusting and overwhelmingly, you know, horrible that crime is. And I had to bear that burden it wasn't me so it forced me to like have a real pessimistic view about everyone you know so even with the courts especially because it was the courts who I looked for salvation from and they was the ones that didn't believe me you know so I became somewhat of a paralegal in prison I started to help myself out and it kind of opened up my mind but in so doing I had to, at some point, you know, open up and share my stories and that vulnerability, you know, became, you know, my nightmare because in the long run, even the people that was helping me, they really didn't believe, you know, it was just an opportunity for them to capitalize, you know, off of, you know, a misfortune, whether it was to find the whether it was just the opportunity just to, you know, use you to exploit you for whatever reason, you know, it was never really a good reason. So, I was under tremendous pressure when it came to trying to focus on my case and trying to get myself out. And I was very pessimistic about the court because every time I would put a petition in and it would get knocked down, it would make me lose faith in the court. So eventually I had to reach out on the outside. So I started to reach out to all different types of organizations and eventually I got a response. And when Nina came into the picture, it was a great relief, man, because at that point in prison, I was in jail for so long and the little bit of hope that some people probably did have that I might have been innocent, it continued to fade as time went on on the inside and on the outside. And at that point in prison, a lot of people began to really, really, really lose faith in me. It almost became like a blanket attack. You know, it's something that I had to deal with, but you know, when Nina stepped into the picture, it was like, You know, it was that it was like a beam of hope. You know what I'm saying? It was like the it was like the lifeline that I really needed because by her just reaching out to me and telling me that they would review my case, it did a lot. For one, it kind of made my spirit, it gave my spirit a sense of relief because I was really crying on the inside. And for two, Take, take your time, Mark, we're here with you. Take your time. And for two, I was able to use that letter as a shield because it gave people a chance to see that it wasn't just my claim. You know, you had a powerful organization that's actually taking heed to what I'm saying and going out their way to, you know, prove what I'm saying is true. So that paper, it became like, it, it, it liberated me in a certain way at that moment because it gave me hope. It gave everyone a chance to be like, you know what, he might be telling the truth. And it just changed, it just changed me completely, man. It just, it just revived a lot in me. And it put me into the position to actually start to, you know, I started socializing a lot. I started interacting with people because now I had this letter 
that showed that there's a possibility that I'm innocent. So, you know, that was like a great resurrecting point in me because even though I was still striving, you know, I was I was overwhelmed by hurt. It was overwhelmed by hurt because, you know, to me as a kid growing up, what people thought about me meant so much. And I actually lived for that. So it was like the very thing that I tried off of to make me who I was, it was no longer there. And it was it was hard because, you know, justice failed me in that aspect. And it seemed like no one believed me. So in my mind, there was no spirit of truth and no one. So even after Nina came into the case and gave me that moment of hope, it lasts for a minute because after a while, you know, I was happy, but then it was taking so long. I was hearing all these things about the DNA couldn't be found and all my, my whole entire incarceration, I was actually hoping and holding on to the fact that if they was to get their hands on that evidence, that would be it. So it was a point when Nina came back and told me that the evidence couldn't be found. And it's like, a part of me inside kind of like felt, you know, because now I was saying, I believe that, I actually believe that it was maliciously intended that the evidence was lost. My heart couldn't really believe that, you know, a system that went out his way to convict me. And in my heart, the evidence was always there. The truth was always there. You know, it was the ugly nature of the case that blinded everyone, but it was always there. So, you know, when they found out that they lost the evidence, I thought it was on purpose. And, you know, it kind of like made me, you know, pessimistic all over again. You know, because now all they have is the truth and they wasn't believing the truth because they had the truth from the very beginning. So I got kind of doubtful, but Nina continued to, you know, speak positively and, you know, tell me to keep my head up and just, you know, keep maintaining and they're going to do everything they can. And, you know, I held on to that. And the constant visit that I was getting, you know, it started to have an effect on the prison population because people started to relate to me different. And somehow that kind of like, it just made me I was still doubtful because of the DNA evidence was missing, but I was still optimistic that somehow, somehow they're gonna get it out because all I really wanted everyone to do is just pay attention. If they pay attention to all the details, they would see that the details actually, the witness freed me over and over again. The, all the victims freed me, science freed me. There was nothing there. So, you know, it was hard, it was hard for me to still have hope in something that I actually perceived that it was no spirit of truth in because I wouldn't have went through what I went through. But, you know, I learned a lot in the course of me being in that predicament. I learned a lot. And at the end of the day, I actually appreciate the fact that Nina came into my life. And I actually appreciate that the fact that it was the very you know, district attorney's office that put me away that helped me to get out. And, you know, somewhere deep inside of me, I always believed that it wasn't because what was done to me was done out of any malicious intent. It was done because of nature. The case was so, was so ugly. And if, if the shoes was on the other foot, I probably would have did that to me too. Because Rape is ugly, it is ugly. It's very ugly, you know, because as I learned in prison, the only thing a person has is their body. And the only power we have over that is the power to consent. And to take that from a person is like the beginning of, is the beginning of all evil, all injustices. So my conviction, it, it affected me deeply because it opened my eyes 
and it made me sensitive to a whole lot, you know? And I'm not holding grudges against nobody, especially not justice, because it's hard to judge matters that you didn't see. It's hard, you know? But certain things can't just left to run amok. So a job needs to be done. But the thing about me that makes me feel good at the end of the day is that I believe it was an honest error on the part of justice, but they went out their way diligently to correct it. So honest error and correction, and that's what I learned in prison. There's nothing wrong with making errors. If it's honestly made, you just have to correct it. And they did that to me, and I'm thankful. You know? Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words, for your, your willingness to share this difficult story and, and, and the traumatic experience you had of losing decades of your life un, unjustly um, behind bars and the courage that you exhibited in remaining steadfast and finding a way to keep pushing forward is an example to all of us. And that even though it is so difficult and, and clearly weight must weigh on you every hour of every day that you're willing to come forward and and share it in in service of us having a better understanding uh, so that other people won't be similarly situated is is a, a real testament to you so we we can't go on before thanking you for your willingness to to share that we we appreciate you we appreciate you dr desert um we want to move a little bit to the way in which you um, joined this in investigation and, and the role that you played in um, helping the facts come to be known and, and uh, advancing this important exoneration. Um, as I understand it, the, the district attorney's office looked to you as an, as an expert on identifications and asked you to conduct some type of review of the evidence in the case. Can you explain to us a, a bit about your role? This, this role of identification seems to be a linchpin of so many cases and um, you, you were perhaps one of the leading experts in this area. So we'd love to hear from you about how it played out in this case and what we should know about these issues more broadly. Yes, well, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. And what's, what's interesting about my role as uh, an expert witness in this case is that uh, I got a chance to meet Mr. Denny about 15 minutes or to about five minutes actually before this panel started. Um, so as the expert witness, um, I'm a scientist and uh, I think what we need to focus on and be reminded of is that there is a great deal of scientific evidence and great deal of scientific literature that really can speak to all of these issues um, that is, you know, dispassionate and, uh, you know, outside of all of, uh, you know, the emotions that I think can be very, very helpful for people who are doing these kinds of reviews. Um, I've been an eyewitness um, expert uh, giving testimony for over 15 years now. And um, when um, Lisa Perlman contacted me, it was the first time that a prosecutor had ever contacted me uh, to review materials and give an opinion in a case. So every other case I've ever uh, you know, worked on and consulted on it for 15 years was a defense attorney in a criminal case or uh, in civil cases um, you know, for the, the plaintiff, an exoneree. Um, and so I was uh, immediately jumped at the chance uh, and was very excited to, to be involved. But quite frankly, it was a very similar process um, for you know, working with an expert witness regardless of the fact that it was uh, a prosecutor that I was uh, working for. And so the, the typical process is to ask for all the materials that are available related to the eyewitness identification in the case, um, which I received. And over a period of about six months, um, we met several times. I reviewed materials, I reviewed trial transcripts, 911 uh, transcript of the call um, that was made and ultimately came to um, write my, my conclusion in my, uh, my, um, in my report. 
Now, an eyewitness expert can never say this witness was right or this witness was wrong. We don't have um, you know, that, the ability to do that. However, there were over 10 factors, 10 eyewitness identification factors relevant in this case that all likely serve to undermine the witness's ability to be able to have a strong memory for the perpetrators in this case. And so I outlined all of those um, you know, factors in, in my report. Um, what's interesting is that I've, I've actually worked for the Innocence Project in other cases, in wrongful conviction cases, and um, I did not know that they were involved um, in this case. And so um, I, I found out surreptitiously um, at, at a dinner, uh, you know, months after I had finished with my involvement in submitting the report. Um, and so it was such a professional um, experience, and certainly to work with, the, um, with Lisa and the Conviction Review unit. Um, and I, I beg and plea <laughs> to uh, prosecutors and others that are out there to reach out to people like me and others. There are several dozen um, really great eyewitness identification experts around the country. And we are scientists. We are academics. We want to share this knowledge and information with people. And, um, you know, I just really encourage people to reach out. I was saying earlier um, before the panel began, I typically um, do, do judicial education uh, now, and but with the pandemic, uh, conferences, in-person conferences have been canceled. But what a great opportunity for Zoom conferences, right? Where you can get the best people at evening hours and you don't have to pay for transportation or hotel costs. It reduces the cost. Education truly is key here uh, so that everyone can better understand what the science has been telling um, or should have been telling people for really many decades now. And, and Lisa, fo following following up on on this point, how how does it happen? How does it you know if if, if one is trying to understand how these wrongful um, identifications, these misidentifications, um, come into the system? How how is it? You know, we think we sort of rely on our on our memory, we, we, we believe things that, that we recall. How, you know, what, are the, what are some of the structural factors that can um, create this risk, this very serious risk? Because as I understand it, that evidence is very powerful in the courtroom. So I was wondering if you could just, just give us a, a, little, a little primer on, on how, that, how that plays out. I think that question maybe is for Jen about the sorry, sorry, Do I, yes. sorry. I meant to put it to Dr. Disser. Yes, sorry, yes. sorry. No, no problem at all. Um, well, there are a multitude of factors that can influence eyewitnesses, uh, you know, recollection of events, and uh, you know, the field for over forty years now has divided um, the factors that influence reliability into two kind of main groups. And the first group is something we call estimator variables. And those are all of the factors that were present at the time of the observation. Um, so usually the, the crime um, itself. Um, in this particular case, there were a, a list, a very long list of factors that likely influenced the victims, um, both victims' ability to be able to form a strong memory. Uh, because that's really what's, what's key. And when I, you know, lecture, you know, on this issue, I try to um, use an analogy that I think most people will be familiar with, and that is memory as a form of trace evidence. So, you know, the eyewitness has the trace evidence right on them. It's up here, and law enforcement need to create tools and have tools to collect the trace evidence as best they can without contaminating the evidence, like other forms of trace evidence we would be worried about, um, and to make sure that the evidence is preserved over time, right? That's a real, a real um, key factor. And so the stronger the evidence at the very beginning, the greater the likelihood we'll be able to collect it and preserve it better. So really weak memories can result from short exposure, we talked about the trauma in this, in this case, the head and face being covered by a cloth, it being relatively dark in the location, um, the, the victim saying she may have even passed out um, from the shock, you know, while all this was going on. And initially she had no memory. 
who couldn't describe people at all and over time came to then give you know more detailed um, descriptions so all of those factors certainly do not help right and and you really need to consider all of those factors now to be clear there's nothing anyone can do about it right so the witness either had a great opportunity to see and had a strong memory or they or they don't and no police procedure is going to be able to remedy that um, and, and to fix that. But the second whole category of factors that are related to witness reliability are what we call system variables. And these essentially are the choices that law enforcement make in the collection and preservation of evidence. What kind of questions am I gonna ask the witness? Am I gonna show the suspect's photograph multiple times? Am I gonna use mugshot searching? Are we gonna do composite sketches, right? So all of these, uh, these identification procedures come with it consequences. And the great news is that there's a scientific literature associated with every single eyewitness identification procedure that is used. Um, and some are better than others. Some are more reliable than others. And so all of these factors together all contribute to whether or not the eyewitness at the end of the day makes a correct or incorrect identification decision. But after they've made a selection, if their identification is supported, if they're given feedback, like good job, like we, that's who we thought it was, or you can sleep better tonight knowing we've got the guy, what a great deal of scientific literature shows is it makes witnesses not only more confident in their identification, but it actually changes the way in which they think about the entire event. They believe they had a better view. They believe they were paying closer attention. They believe their memory is stronger than it actually is just by giving that feedback. So you're absolutely right. It's very powerful in court. And with rare exception, witnesses are nearly 100% certain by the time they testify. That's what happened in this case as well. The witness was never asked about confidence prior to trial. But when she identified Mark at trial, she was absolutely certain that it was him. We have scientific explanations for how all of these things can come to be. And that's what I hope I helped um, Lisa and the conviction review team kind of understand through, through the science and, uh, and through the literature. Thank you for that understanding. I think, I think it's so, so important. Um, Nina and Lisa, I'd, I'd, I'd like to turn back to you as, as we've just heard there are certain structural factors that can affect these cases and do affect these cases. And um, then as we've also heard from Mr. Denny's own account, there, there, there's a very individualized story. It's, it's very personal. And so maybe it would be helpful if the two of you could help us understand in, in what ways um, did this case have the types of things that you see in other cases? What were what were there patterns that you were seeing in this case? And in what ways was this case different than um, other experiences that you've had? Just so we can help help uh, help our audience understand um, the complexity of doing this type of work. Sure, I can I can start off and then give it to Lisa. Um, uh, and let me just add to pivoting off what Jen said about her willingness and ability to uh, work with other DA's offices. I, I think if those of you who are in DA's offices on this call should take her up on that offer before your colleagues grab her. I, there's uh, no one better at breaking this down in terms that us lawyers who aren't scientists can understand. And um, among the things that she's terrific at is helping offices, police departments and DA's offices figure out front end policies to design to you know, how do you evaluate an ID when it comes in the door, not just 30 years later, but how do you decide what charges to pursue and to go ahead with? Um, and how can you work with your local police departments to make sure that their procedures are minimizing the risk of, of wrongful convictions and wrongful IDs? Um, but as to your question, you know, I mean, as I said in my initial answer, like we had this clear mis ID present in 75% of the DNA exoneration cases. Um, you know, we had what seemed to be real tunnel vision and a rush to judgment, possibly based on race, possibly based on the nature of the crime. Um, what was hard about this case for us from an investigative standpoint, and one of the reasons why I, I don't think Mark would ever be a free man were it not for a CRU like Brooklyn's, is that um, his cousin had come forward many years earlier to say that there were only three people involved. And so the DNA wasn't really going to clear him because if we just showed three people's DNA, um, 
they would just say, well, Mark didn't you know, leave any DNA behind and we can't prove his absence by the fact that no DNA is detected, plus the evidence was gone. Um, and you know, having a court credit the word of someone who admitted he took part in a brutal rape and robbery and had done other crimes, other robberies um, that also involved weapons and put people at great risk was gonna be a heavy lift. And if the DA didn't believe him or didn't believe that part of his account, we had no chance. And we also, when we took the case, had never spoken with the other co-defendants that Lisa mentioned. And I made a difficult strategic decision that we were not gonna do that, that we might only have one shot at talking to them, that you know we had worked with that unit before, I'd never worked with Lisa directly, but that we would trust them to do that investigation because it was so important that they be the, the first ones to evaluate those witnesses' credibility. And if you know they had something to say that was helpful to Mark, I wanted them to hear it first and directly um, and not put my thumb on the scale would be perceived as putting my thumb on the scale. Um, and that wouldn't have worked if I had just gone to interview them, gotten statements and taken them to court. It just, it's not the way, you know, in other cases that might be something we do, but here, and that, that took a lot of trust. And I had to tell Mark, you know, we're not gonna go talk to these folks. We're gonna let the DA's office do it. Remember, and Mark was like, are you sure? Well, how do you know? And I said, we don't, but I, one thing I can tell you is if I just file a motion in court, it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, and similarly, you know, it's not in every case that I have my clients talk with the DAs directly. Um, we waited to do that till nearer to the end of their investigation, but we agreed to have Mark be interviewed by them with no limitations on what he could say, except some general, you know, stuff about attorney client privilege, which I knew they wouldn't ask anyway. Um, and I was present in case Mark had questions, was concerned just to put him at ease. Um, but it was Lisa and these two wonderful detectives um, who, you know, conducted a really respectful interview. And Mark, to his credit, was open and clear and thoughtful and, um, you know, really made his own, his own case for innocence in a way that I couldn't. Lisa? Um, sure. So in thinking about this case, I, um, I believe that what was so, you know, important and interesting about this particular exoneration is that in, in many of our exoneration, there's sort of a a piece of evidence that 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 turns the case. You know, there's there's a recantation that's very credible, or there's new evidence that we didn't know of at the time, or there's a clear violation of due process or loss of faith in a confession because of a variety of factors. And here it was the totality of what the investigation was was turning up. And I, I urge people that are uh, doing these types of investigations to not wait for that big moment if it's not coming, because here, for example, and I sort of went through a lot of it, you know, um, without getting into too much detail, I was initially laughed at when I suggested that we travel to the middle of the country to speak to a co-defendant because, you know, what, what's, what value was there in the statement of a co-defendant? They're inherently an interested party. And, and meanwhile, that turned out to be a very compelling piece of evidence, as I explained earlier, that this co-defendant admitted his participation and he had gotten away with it. He had nothing to gain by speaking to us whatsoever and didn't know who uh, of his co-defendants was making a claim of innocence and was able to tell us that Mark Denny was not there. Now that alone, even as compelling as it was, couldn't necessarily be enough. And then we had these discrepancies in uh, the, the accounts of the victim and you know as dr dysart explained and and she explained to me which is my takeaway from this is that memory as we we often think memory gets better over time but it does not that is what i learned from from jen dysart is memory gets worse over time and yet the victim here was interviewed nine well she gave nine accounts between the 911 call and then the doctors and then the, you know, the responding police officers, the hospital, the detectives that responded and then they realized it was a sex crime case and then they thought it might be part of a pattern robbery. So then the robbery squad detectives were doing their own interview and then there was the grand jury and ultimately the trial. And, and you know, I, I ultimately made a chart of the discrepancies in the, the number of perpetrators and the descriptions of the, of, of the perpetrators, of the acts assigned to each of the perpetrators. And it was clear that, that, that 
the memories were were not forming. And you know, I when I think about this, and when I think about um, what Nina was saying, it's it's true. We have to stay aware of where our expertise ends and we have to know what we can't understand and we have to enlist the experts when we need them such as Dr. Dysart to explain what all of that meant and taking what Dr. Dysart uh, taught us and then taking a real hard look at you know and I believe with the very best of intentions the case detectives and even the trial assistant DA at the time they had a case theory and they they were wedded to it with you know with good intentions and as and as even as mark said himself because i think of the brutality and heinousness of the crime there was this drive to to solve this and there was a case theory that there were four individuals and and there were pieces that were starting to sort of not be given as much attention as they should. And we saw this in misstatements in the summation. We saw this in failings of the defense attorney, um, both in summation and cross-examination. And so I guess all that we were learning was, was it was becoming clear that the totality of the investigation was leading to the fact that, that Mark Denny wasn't there and that he was actually innocent. And, and I guess, and just real quick, I wanted to say that at the very beginning, I wanna make sure that, that this audience understands that um, not only was Mark's sentence vacated, it was his conviction that was vacated. Thank you. Mr. Denny, I, I wanna come back to you for, for a second. We've heard a bit about the, the process that led to your exoneration and the, and the vacature of the, of the conviction um, and, and sentence. Can, can you tell us a little bit about um, how long it was between that time when Nina sent you the letter that was the, 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 the sign of hope for you and the time when you walked out of that courthouse in Brooklyn? And can you give us a little bit of a window into what life was like after 30 years being a free person? Well, I, I can't remember. I'm kind of foggy on the timeline, but I believe it may have been around 2008. Yeah, it was, about, I, it was about eight years total, nine years, 300 days. Yeah, it was about approximately eight years or nine years after I got the first initial letter from Nina to the point of me actually walking out of the courtroom. So within that period, I, as I was saying earlier, I was very optimistic because, you know, I had a light of hope. Not only that I was coming home, but that I was able to, you know, be at more peace within the facility. Because even the guards, I was even showing that letter to the guards to get them off my back. And, you know, the letter meant a lot. You know what I'm saying? It changed a lot. And it showed me, man, that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people do want the right things to get done. And they do believe in justice. But certain things just causes doubt. And unless there's other factors that can erase those doubts. You know, that's just how it is. And for me, you know, that's pretty much what it was. But that time period, it did cause me to doubt, but I hang on anyway because Nina was very consistent with communication, with visits. You know, she was introducing me to other paralegals. So to me, it became more than just uh, the fact that I had a good person that was trying to help me get out of prison. It was an opportunity for me to reawaken certain parts to me that shut down certain social parts like the company of women that was a big deal to me because it meant everything for me for for a woman to not see me in a light that I wasn't so it made me you know I kind of like I kind of thought that I had lost that connection because I've been so I've been ridiculed for so long and been perceived for so long and the image of me been you know, stained across the minds of a lot of women. And once that whole thing turned around, even though I wasn't completely out of jail yet, for the fact that the guards was more embraced, it was let me have access to things that they wouldn't, they would talk to me, you know, it, it started to make me feel better overall. So the process of regaining my sense of, you know, you know, just being, just being a free being, it was gradually coming back to me. But I did lose faith. I'm not going to lie about that. I kind of did lose faith. And it kind of picked back up because the momentum of the case started to increase. You know, Nina started to come up. The paralegals started to come up. And they started to give me 
you know, insights that let me know that it was getting closer and closer to establishing what I've been saying all along. And it meant so much to me. So that process was really like an awakening process because the first 18 or so years in prison, I was slowly dying mentally, spiritually, you know, I was just slowly dying. And Nina coming into my life actually reversed that process. You know, it reversed that process and it put me back. It just made me more social. It made me more happy. I started to not pay certain things any mind. And it just began to revive hope all over in me all over again, you know? And when the time come for me actually coming out of prison, I was happy. I was happy, but at the same token, I was kind of blank because you know, all those years I wanted to be free. I wanted my innocence to be, you know, acknowledged. And here it is, it finally happened when I actually doubted it. So now it's like, it's like I had to make up for the void. And how I went about making up for this void, I try to, you know, reconnect to those things that I knew before I got locked up, like friends and family. It was kind of like shaky, you know what I'm saying, going about that because a part of me is like, it was like a still, it was a void. That 30 years created a void that kind of made me, it disconnected me from a whole lot, you know, because when I came back out, one of the things that I was concerned about was I was still in the same neighborhood and a lot of the people that I was seeing and meeting was people of, friends and relatives that I knew long ago. You got cousins and uncles and the little kids that I used to, you know, say hi to a cut they had now they grown, they got children, but I'm not connected to none of that. I was totally dis disconnected. I just felt totally disconnected, you know, but now looking back, it's been approximately three years since I've been home. And I'm definitely happy for my freedom because I get the chance to choose. I get the chance to move about. You know, I get the chance to make errors without not feeling that I have to be penalized. You know what I'm saying? I get the chance to interact, you know. <laughs> I just get the chance to just eat what I want to eat, go where I want to go. You know, gradually and slowly, I'm starting to get my sense of me back again. I'm starting to get my sense back of me again. But it's a challenge. It is a challenge because a lot of things I really don't know, like the ABCs of life when it comes to technologies and going about certain, you know, uh, filing certain paperwork, you know, certain dots I'm still pretty much obscured about. So I actually rely on a lot of help. I actually rely on a lot of help. And one of the things that's very gratifying to me is that it seems like everywhere that I reach out to help, people are always willing to help me, whether it's friends, whether it's strangers, you know, everyone is willing to help me. My process of transitioning is gradual, but everyone is helping me. And that network is what really makes me feel alive because as I was saying earlier, people's opinion always meant everything to me. When I look back on my life, I can see that I live just to be appraised by people, not anyone, but appraised for doing good things. So. That's where I'm at right now in my life. I'm really trying to, you know, reintroduce myself back into society and become a very important part. This camera keep falling. You know, where I could do great things. Well, you well, you're, sorry, sorry, Mr. Denny, you were saying? No, I was wondering if you guys could hear me because- Oh yeah. Falling. Yeah, no, we, we can hear, we can hear and see you and and you're, you're, you're doing great things and providing a, a great service today by helping us learn more about this. So thank you. Thank you for, for all of that. Um, I, there, there have been a number of, of questions from, from our audience, and I, and I thought maybe I might sort of pick up some of those questions and group them together and put, put, put them out there for our experts and, and, and Mr. Denny to, to respond to. Um, there, there were some case specific questions that, that folks were wondering about, things like, um, what was, was Mr. Denny tried together with other defendants or, or separately? What um, questions about the specific interval between the, um, the, the arrest and, and, the, and the crime and the identification? 
um, some 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 factual questions about you know how how it all unfurled, and I I don't know if Lisa or Nina want to want to want to take a stab at a couple of those so that folks can just sort of understand some of those core facts, and then we'll we'll move on to some higher level questions. Um, I think I can take a shot at this. the The crime was in late December of eighty seven, and there were interviews and interviews and interviews that went into the investigation was going into January and through February. And I believe that it was in the middle of March where uh, Mark and his cousin, uh, his cousin in particular became a suspect, which led to the other co-defendants and Mark. And those identification uh, procedures were done, I, I, they were in the teens of March. So let's say it was March 16th or 17th, something like that where the photo array was shown, but then the lineup was shown two days later. So we had, um, I think that it was about 10 weeks from the crime to when the first photo array was shown, but just two days later for the lineup. Um, with the exception of the one of the co-defendants was not uh, taken into well was in custody on something else and was lineups were done with that fourth co-defendant uh, in May, but the case was indicted, I believe, at the end of March. Great. I'm going to say, well, I'm surprised you didn't put in a plug for our report at this very <laughs> wonderful juncture. So let me tell the folks who are watching um, uh, that, in case you aren't already aware, um, back in July, Davos firm, Wilmer Hale, uh, with a team of pro bono lawyers that he led, and my office, and um, some staff from the Conviction Review Unit and the general counsel at the time of the DA's office, Telly Weinstein, um, we spent about a year and a half um, doing a really amazing landmark project with the DA's office in which we were given uh, confidential access to the memos that each of the CRU staff had written in the 25 exoneration cases that the CRU had handled um, up to the point we started the project. Um, those are still not public, um, but we were wrote a 90 plus page report looking at all of the histories of those cases and analyzing the common factors among them with an eye both towards how folks could use those cases to guide mm -hmm. conviction review investigations, but also how to improve front end practices. Um, you will not see Mark Denny's name in there because um, under New York ceiling laws, the cases are, are anonymous unless someone like Mark chooses to participate or gives us his permission to participate in an event like this. Uh, so he will be listed under the uh, not very disguised pseudonym, Brian Davidson. But if you search for that name, you'll see it throughout the report as well as a lot of others. And, and we quoted with the DA's permission a lot from Jen Dysart's um, eyewitness ID findings as well. So folks who have questions about the case history and how it fits into the bigger picture should get out their printers and look at that very big report. Thanks, Nina. A very, a very important plug. And I, and I would just say for folks listening, one, one of the, one of the significant contributions of that report is, I think it was the first time ever that a DA's office had dug that deeply into a series of cases and to sort of identify and explain in context the problems that resulted in exonerations. And so it's, it's worth a look for folks who are interested in these issues, um, obviously painful stories as, as we've heard today, but uh, th there, are some, uh, there are some takeaways, I think, to be, to be gathered from that report. And, and Dr. Dissert, I wanted to come back to you for a moment. There were, there were a couple of questions directed to you. Um, one, one of them was that the, the um, science of eyewitness identification is, is, uh, seems not to be accepted in every jurisdiction. We have some folks from across the world who are, who are watching um, our and participating in our, our conversation today. And we've heard that that in, in some countries it's not recognized as science yet. And so th there's, this is sort of a two part question. How, how well accepted is the science that you've been speaking about today of, of eyewitness uh, identification and the, and the memory science that, that you've spoken about? That's the first part. And then the second part is many people are interested in what scholarly works of yours um, or in the field more broadly, perhaps, you would point audience members to 
who are interested in digging a, a little bit deeper and understanding a little bit more about all of this. Great. Um, so what's fascinating about this, uh, about this field is that there are actually researchers from all over the world that uh, participate in, in the contribute to the scientific literature. Um, I did take a, a, a second to scroll through some of the, the Q&A during the session and um, shout out to Canada. I'm actually a dual citizen. Um, born and raised in Canada. And since 2001, so gosh, uh, 20 years now, I have um, been going up to Canada and lecturing for the National Judicial Institute, which is the judges. Um, and uh, once a year, once every 18 months or so um, on the science of eyewitness identification. And it's true that not all jurisdictions accept expert testimony. Uh, so that's true of Canada. They don't, uh, they don't like um, expert testimony, people like me to come in and try to educate people for some reason. Um, and across the United States, um, Nina can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe every state now permits expert testimony. Um, there were a couple holdouts for a few years, but now it's every state allows uh, expert testimony. In fact, some states say if the defense attorney does not call an eyewitness expert, it could be ineffective assistance of counsel. So, um, so the science is pretty well accepted um, uh, around the world. And as I said, memory researchers from all over the world do contribute. And it turns out memory doesn't work uh, differently if you, you know, have a different passport. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the nice, the nice news that this is um, universal. Uh, so with respect to my own work, I'm published in the field, but what I would strongly recommend for people who want um, information about best practices. So those are the, the things we can actually do to influence the reliability of the identification outcome. The American Psychology Law Society, which is part of the American Psychological Association, uh, published in uh, February of last year, 2020, a revised white paper on the best practices for eyewitness identification procedures. And you can go online and download that for free. I'm not sure if we're gonna have uh, maybe some links or other things available to participants at some point. I'm happy to provide that as well. But it's um, the APLS, American Psychology Law Society, white paper on best practices. Um, and so it lists nine best practices to, um, to implement. Um, I, I'm not going to push a book, but I am a co-author of a book with Elizabeth Loftus, James Doyle, and Karen Neuwirth um, called Eyewitness Testimony, Civil and Criminal. It's in his sixth edition now, um, published by LexisNexis, um, and it's a, it's a um, soup to nuts um, kind of coverage on the science and then also practices for, um, for attorneys. So it's really written for, for attorneys. So um, you might want to check out one or both of those. Entirely appropriate to push a book when, when the audience <laughs> question asks asks for your, your publications on the issue. So thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I just, um, Dave, I just put yeah. in the chat um, for everybody. It should come up for attendees as well. A link to the Innocence Project and Wilmer and DA report as well as our policy recommendations. And I think there's going to be, this presentation is going to be recorded and on the IAP website. So maybe we can get Alyssa and Michelle to post those and the APLA paper Jen mentioned as well. Fantastic, very, very important to have those resources out there. So um, why, why, don't we, why don't we sort of go through with it with a little bit of a lightning round and, and see if folks have, have, have two things that they, that they wanna leave the audience with that are, that are most important about thinking about ways in which we can avoid um, some of these uh, tragedies. And, and we will, we will um, conclude with, with Mr. Denny and, and maybe we'll, We'll, we'll work our way through uh, Nina as the as the co-author of the report and somebody who uh, who does it every day. I, I feel comfortable putting putting you on the spot. Maybe two is two is too few, but in in light of our time, if there if there are two things that you wanted to hold up or underscore that that we should be thinking about as system interrupters um, in in these cases, based on your experience, what what would you share? Um, well, I think. Uh keep sticking to this case specifically rather than my soapbox for all wrongful convictions generally. I mean, I think we see here um, the critical importance of not letting the heinous nature of a crime blind you, whether police officers, prosecutors, or defense counsel at the charging stage, at the prosecution stage, to the cold hard reality of whether the evidence 
really powerfully supports the charge against the person who's come under suspicion. And I think, I would like to think that were this case brought today, Mark would never have been prosecuted once the defects in the ID became clear. Um, and then the second thing I'd say, I'm gonna take a little liberty and go to the back end. I think that um, this case really, as we started off, shows the enormous power of conviction review units to do justice. And I hope that every day in the country, gives his unit the discretion and the authority to go where the facts take them and the resources to do it that um, Eric Gonzalez and his predecessor, John Thompson did in Brooklyn. Um, because, and ultimately the buck stopped with him and without bombshell new evidence, without DNA, he really trusted his unit to say, we clearly got this one wrong. And that is no small thing. Thanks, Nina. L Lisa, um, can you share your perspective? Sure. Um, and just before I do, because I did see a question in the chat, I think that it's very important and I won't spend real time on it, but I just did see a question about um, how we handled approaching the original crime victim, who's a, a most amazing survivor, so strong and was just brutalized and unimaginably. Um, and I, I do want to point out to colleagues that might find themselves in this position, as I said earlier, in terms of Dr. Dysart, to know where our expertise ends. And before you pick up the telephone, you have to appreciate not only the trauma, but the re-traumatization that will occur just from you interrupting their day 29, days, 29 years later to say, hey, I wanna talk about that rape or hey, I wanna talk about that murder that happened to your family victim if it's a different case, something like that, that can really re-traumatize somebody just to bring this into their present day. Before you pick up the phone, you wanna to speak to a social worker. Um, I had a social, very senior social worker who was amazing, Miriam Sadiq, who I brought with me to speak with the victim in this case. And I also consulted um, Jennifer Thompson, who, uh, is an original crime victim herself who founded an amazing organization called Healing Justice. And she, among many other things that she taught me, taught me the importance of the messaging in this case. And so when this exoneration, when it was determined that there'd be an exoneration um, and to Nina's great credit, we were all on the same page at the exoneration and the words that were spoken on the record um, and you know the media was in the courtroom and there was nobody that was saying that the victim made a mistake. We were talking you know, with language, thankfully from Jen, that you know, her, her memory had been corrupted, that best practices weren't used, that this wasn't something that she did and that there was no blame put on her. And you know, that's not as an exciting of a story as some victim that comes along and does something with malice or makes a mistake. And the media just couldn't seize on that, but that would further re-traumatize somebody. And, and there's just inherent trauma in the fact that closure that they thought that they had gotten has been undone. Um, and, and the messaging was across the board. And, and the most amazing act of grace that I saw that day was that Mark Denny himself actually said in open court that he wishes that he could have been the hero that she needed that day, um, acknowledging not only his empathy and, and amazing capacity after all that he'd been put through as a victim of this crime himself, um, but also to acknowledge that a crime had occurred and that, that it was heinous. Um, so that was amazing, but I'm sorry that I, I just felt that was really important. Um, in terms of the, the takeaways, I think that what we need to do is to change the culture in prosecutors' offices, um, to instill in not only new ADAs that there's value in perhaps working uh, to build a case and finding that it actually falls apart, that that should be celebrated and that's valued work as well, that, that to embrace our role to do justice and not just to get convictions. And when I say not just the new ADAs, because that is something that needs to put forward as they come into our office. But perhaps in many respects, even more important is that old guard, that mid-level and upper level of uh, prosecutors that have been there for a long time that are in the positions of, of management and supervising that not only are making the decisions about whether a case needs to be dismissed or what a plea offer should be, um, but also the seasoned attorneys that will be suitable for a conviction review unit. And so we need to change that culture to embrace the, the fuller um, role of the prosecutor to do justice. Um, and also uh, on a more specific note, you know, I think that you know, since I started in the office, I've seen a change in the culture 
to what we kind of call this kick the can down the road mentality that may have existed decades ago, where a case would come in and we'd say, hmm, you know, let's see what the grand jury says and, and we'll leave it to them because they're the screening mechanism that we have in our system. And when a case would get indicted, we'd say, well, well, you know, we'll, we'll give it to a trial jury to decide. And we now take much more ownership of situations such as this, where we had, you know, multiple accounts that were inconsistent, that should have raised eyebrows and um, been considered. And, and now in our office, you know, when we have cases that are not corroborated, um, based on the testimony of one witness. Those are some of the most highly scrutinized cases before they would be put to a grand jury. Great, Dr. Dissert, maybe, maybe the, the one big, uh, the one big uh, takeaway for us so we can get to Mr. Denny for a, a parting word. Absolutely, I'll, and I'll keep it short. Um, my advice is just because a procedure has been used in a, in a department or an investigative office for a long period of time does not mean that it's reliable and does not mean that it's scientifically sound. Uh, for example, composites or sketches have been involved and implicated in over 25% of the DNA exoneration cases, which is astronomical given how rarely they're actually used. Mugshot searching where witnesses come in and th this was used in this case as well, they look at hundreds, if not thousands of photographs in the hopes that you know, the witness might point somebody out who then becomes the lead suspect. And then that person uh, in almost every circumstance I've ever seen, that person's photo, like in Mark's case, ends up in another identification procedure or that person is arrested and then is presented for a second time. These repeated identification procedures, which you know were almost required almost in New York, right? Uh, you know, Lisa, for many, many years, um, they're not scientifically sound and they're, they're not reliable identification procedures. So, so my advice is look to the science. And if you don't know the science, reach out to people who do. It, it's always evolving and it's very difficult even for us to keep up with the scientific literature sometimes. And so you cannot be expected to know everything. Um, and so I'm very grateful um, that Lisa reached out to me and um, I'm very proud of really the work, you know, that we did in this case. And um, I, I, I hope my phone rings. I hope my other colleagues um, have, you know, their phone really off the hook with prosecutors who really want to know more about, about the science and what these procedures, um, you know, the impact that these procedures have on reliability. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Nina and and to our, our hosts here at, at, at John Jay, uh, it would be great if we could have some some information about the case. There are lots of questions. Folks are fascinated in the in the Q and A and, and want to drill down on the details. So hopefully they can go to your websites and and, and learn more there. But Mr. Denny, um, turning turning to you uh, for for the last word, uh, you said to us that the letter was a shield, and it liberated you in a certain way at that moment. Um, we, we know that it was a, a system and many people that participated in the injustice that was visited upon you. And in the same way, it was many people who had to come together within the context of the system to find that justice could ultimately be done for you. And so we leave you with the, the, the last word about what you would like our audience to think about in, in terms of the 24,000 um, years that, that we heard earlier, people have served behind wrongful convictions. And what you have made clear to us today is that people who are fortunate enough to be exonerated live with the pain 24 hours a day, even after they are exonerated and on the outside. So we leave it to you for a closing word. Well, I could say that, You know, what I'm hearing so far is that, you know, when we talk about injustices, we actually talking about people who take up the position of justice and for whatever reason, you know, they decide to cut corners. And that's where a lot of the, you know, and, and, and that's where a lot of the, what's the word I want to use? That's where a lot of the injustices are born is people who take up it's people who take the oath to uphold the law, but they don't have the integrity to maintain that upholdment. And it is those people 
that make that give justice the ugly look. And that's on all levels. You know what I'm saying? Because one of the things that I learned being in jail is that I was forced to see that everything in life is governed by rules. Whether it's bad or good, everything in life is governed by rules. And the way you excel in a certain thing is by following those rules. The rules are the ladder that leads to the top. And the only issue with that is the people who are in those positions to enforce the rules, but they decide to, for whatever reason to cut corners. Because like in my case, maybe because the ugly nature of the case really brought out the heroic spirit in many, I don't really know. You know what I'm saying? It may seem like a good thing, but at the end of the day, if a person take an oath to uphold the law, regardless of how heroic and passionate they come about something, they restricted and they constrained by those laws. They, 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 they have to maintain that because if they're not doing that, then the integrity of the whole justice system is questionable. It's like the people that's in power now is no more different than the common criminal because at the end of the day, everyone is role playing while justice is not really getting that enforcement and protection that it needs. You know, I think the rules and the laws and all that stuff is good. But if you don't have good people behind it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So uh, the, the, the important thing that I would like people to take away from this, not just injustice on all levels, we have to learn how to play by the rules of whatever it is that we're involved in if we want to be protected by that same thing. And not playing by the rules is what put all of us, give all of us equal standing. We are the cause of all the chaos that's going on in the world. We all have to look at, at, at ourselves in the face. It's a collective thing, but it's also an individual thing. And another thing that disturbs me about the justice system is the sentence guideline. The sentence guideline is crazy. I mean, 100 years, 200 and something years. I mean, at what point in those numbers do people get the chance to show that they rehabilitated? And if you're not sure if the people you convicted is actually guilty, why would your sentence guideline be so definite? It's almost like they think that the people is immortal or maybe they believe in the doctrine of reincarnation. I don't know, but the average person cannot complete that. So it's like the people that's in the power of creating these laws it's like they, those are the people that really need to be taken a look at, man, because it's like they have this cartoon aspect on life. Because if you know a person could only live 75 years average and you want to give them a thousand years, what is you saying? It's like you're making a mockery. You know, they got to reduce the sentence guideline because as long as justice is blind, and I think that to be that justice is impartial, because if you can't see, you have no choice but to be impartial. And justice is always going to make error. We're going to make error. But to, as, 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 where the innocent is concerned, some type of safeguard has to be there. And I think that if they cut down on the sentence guideline, whether the person is guilty or innocent, it'll give everybody a chance to correct themselves and probably come out and probably live their lives all over again. If they're wrongfully convicted, at least they still got a chance to come out. They gave me all this time. I could have died in jail if Nina... And all these great people didn't get on board to help me get out. Why? Because the people that we're supposed to look up to, that the world wants us to aspire to be, those are the people that's, that's, that's creating all these stumbling blocks for us. They need to stop that, man. People are going to take an oath to live by the law. They have to have the integrity to live to that regardless of what. And the sentence guideline is ridiculous. No one can do that. That sentence guideline shows that the system does not care about the people. You can't possibly care if you're not giving no one a chance to come out. That's crazy, man. They need to fix that. They need to fix that. And one more thing I want to say, they need to introduce edu the, the legal education into the public school. You can't wait for a person to come out of school and go to college to have to pay to understand what their powers and their rights are that you holding them accountable for. It's a whole lot of stuff that's just backwards and all over the place, man. But the government which is our ultimate parent, they have a responsibility. They have all the rules. They just got to live by it. They're not living by it. They keep cutting corners for what? For well, what? We, 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 we appreciate you, Mr. Mr. Denny, and, and all that you have shared and it, your, your bravery, both in, in remaining steadfast in your innocence and uh, the focus that brought you uh, to find this team and to, and to get this team to 
operate and, and, and try to deliver some measure of, of justice. And we wish you the, the very best uh, in, in the future. And, and we, know the, the, we know the road is long, but we have confidence in you. And we thank you so much for having the courage to share your story. And we all, we all have taken something from it. And I'm sure many people will. Thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to say one more thing. You know, first, thank you so much, Dable, for moderating a wonderful and insightful conversation. I want to thank our panelists again for participating, especially you, Mr. Denny. Uh, you know, I don't think I can say it better than Dable, but you obviously have been through far more than any of us can imagine. I appreciate you telling us about your experience and your strength in really persevering and overcoming this 30 year ordeal is, is truly an inspiration. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that we have a panel on perspectives of best practices in conviction review units on February 23rd. And then we have a third panel about supporting original crime victims during an exoneration on March 15th. Uh, I wanna thank Nina and Lisa again for their assistance in planning these panels and giving their unique insight as we put together a really great series for you all. Uh, Lisa was instrumental in helping me plan the third panel, which is gonna feature several people from the Healing Justice Network, uh, who she mentioned earlier today. Uh, you can learn about the series and more about our work on www.prosecution.org. And we are going to put the resources that were mentioned, including the 400 26 years report from the Brooklyn DA's office and Wilmer Hale um, and Professor Dysart, I will ask you to send me some of those resources you mentioned and we'll put that on the website as well so that people have easy access to it. Um, so thank you again, everyone, especially you, Mr. Denny, for, for your time and dedication to this work. And until next time, thank you all for watching and have a wonderful day. Likewise.